Susan Robin Bender was born on November 27, 1970, in Modesto, California, as the only child of Patricia Chupka Bender. On April 25, 1986, Susan, then 15 years old, left her family home to visit friends in Carmel-by-the-Sea for the weekend. She walked to the Greyhound bus station on 10th Street and G Street. While waiting for the bus, Susan ran into friends. She told them about her excursion to the coast and that she planned to be back in a few days. After their conversation was ended, Susan made a call at the depot payphone. About 10 minutes later, a full-sized olive green 1977 Ford van pulled up. Susan got into the vehicle. This was the last time that Susan was seen. She had a lot of freedom for a 15-year-old, which was not terribly uncommon in the 1980s. Pat Bender, Susan's mother, assumed that Susan had safely made it to Carmel and was having fun with her friends. When Susan failed to call home, as she usually did, her mother became worried. She reported her daughter missing on May 1, 1986. Detectives soon came to the conclusion that something terrible had happened to Susan. One detective told the local newspaper, We have certain evidence to indicate foul play was involved in the disappearance of Susan Bender. Susan's mother told the same newspaper that Susan had run away twice before, but each time she had returned home in fairly short order. She said, Everything had been good between us for a couple of months before she disappeared. There was no indication that she was going to run away. She added that an unnamed male person of interest had been found with Susan's diary, phone book, and clothing in his possession. Pat continued, I am afraid she was attacked by a man the police questioned but never arrested. They did not arrest him even though they had a lot of circumstantial evidence against him. Police always believed Susan was not missing of her own volition. Detective Richard Reidenauer, who was assigned to the case until his retirement in 2000, told a newspaper in 1987 that he thought Susan was most likely not alive anymore. In 1999, Susan's mother said in an interview, the police said there is little they can do without a body. Detective Reidenauer commented in that same year, Susan Bender just fell off the face of the earth. What is really strange about this case is that nothing has ever come up about her in all these years, and no one has ever come forward with any information about what happened to her. Also in 1999, Lauren Herzog and Wesley Shermantine, two childhood friends from Linden, California, targeted young women in and around the nearby Stockton area. There was some speculation that perhaps Susan was one of their victims. Many of their victims have never been identified. Authorities did not know if the men had anything to do with Susan's abduction, but it is possible as she vanished in the time that they were busy with their evil deeds. Susan's disappearance fit their modus operandi for victims. But despite years of investigation into Herzog and Shermantine's crimes, there had never been a link to Susan's case. They went on a spree in the 1980s and 1990s. They took the lives of several females and may have had more than 15 victims. In the meantime, Susan's case remained unsolved. For nearly four decades, investigators spoke to family and friends who fought to keep Susan's story alive. Sandy Silveria, a friend of Susan, commented in 2021, Where is she? What happened to her? Whoever did this, they have to be held accountable. In October 2021, the Modesto Police Department announced that they reopened the case in the hopes of finally locating the long-lost teenager. The department said in a statement, in reviewing this case, we identified potential areas of opportunity which may assist in moving this case forward. This includes the use of advancements in technology. Given the circumstances of the crime, we also believe there may be individuals, previously unidentified, 
who may have pertinent information surrounding Susan's disappearance. Modesto's cold case investigators were hoping that the many years since Susan's disappearance had increased witnesses' willingness to speak out. The police department said in a statement in 2022, It is important to remember that Susan was a child with a family. Unfortunately, that family has gone 36 years without closure or justice. It is our job as an agency to assist in providing some level of closure with the ultimate goal of getting justice. Then, on Thursday, August 17, 2023, the Modesto Police Department announced the arrest of Raymond Lewis Stafford. He is 76 years old. Stafford was arrested on August 15 in Wills Point, 50 miles east of Dallas, where he had been living for around five years. Stafford appeared to be hiding in plain sight for decades. Detectives got an arrest warrant on August 10, but it was not until Tuesday that members of the Van Zandt County Sheriff's Department in Texas showed up at his home and took him into custody. He was arrested without incident and subsequently booked into the Van Zandt County Jail and charged with taking Susan's life. Modesto police did not give further details about what they believe happened to Susan. Stafford is currently incarcerated in Texas, awaiting extradition to California. Exactly how detectives zeroed in on Stafford as a suspect has not been detailed. Modesto police are differing questions to the Stanislaus County District Attorney's Office, saying there was no other information they could release. Newspapers and local radio stations did reach out to the Modesto Police Department and Stanislaus County District Attorney to learn what led to the suspect's arrest, but did not receive a response. No information was released about how exactly Susan might have met her end, whether there is any chance of recovering her body, or what new evidence resulted in the charges against Stafford. In a news release, Modesto police expressed their gratitude to the Stanislaus County District Attorney's Office, the California Department of Justice, and various Texas authorities for their help in the long and challenging investigation. It said, the collaborative efforts of these agencies have been instrumental in bringing closure to Susan Robin Bender's case. As detectives suspected foul play right from the start, they had a suspect nearly from the start. According to court records filed in Stanislaus County, investigators at the time traced the green van to Stafford after he was arrested on suspicion of an unrelated burglary a month after Susan vanished. He had not been publicly named at the time. In the course of their investigation, they learned that Stafford had briefly worked with Susan's mother, Patricia Bender. At the time, she said that she believed Stafford may have formed a relationship with her daughter after calling their home phone. Court documents showed that Pat worked for Stafford for a few days back in 1985 at his security business. They also said she admitted to dating Stafford on a few occasions. Thus, Stafford was well known to Susan. It was his rental van which Susan had been seen getting into at the bus stop. She got into his van without hesitation, according to her friend, who witnessed everything at the day of her disappearance at the bus station. A woman who lived with Stafford in the 1980s said he confessed that he strangled a female with a cord or wire and buried her near the Big Oak flat entrance to Yosemite. He said, according to court records obtained, that he drove to a campground near the Big Oak flat entrance to Yosemite National Park and dug the grave. Less than a year after Susan disappeared, Stafford, then 38, ran for Modesto City Council. He was asked by the local newspaper about his criminal record, but told the paper in July 1985 it was a result of him being in the wrong place at the wrong time. His arrests were listed as operating an unlicensed private investigator business 
and carrying a badge saying he was a private investigator. Stafford said that his campaign was focused on policies to protect children from predators. He added, We do not spend any time getting the people who are harassing our children. Unsurprisingly, he lost the election. Five months later, in December 1986, Stafford was convicted of setting a business on fire and pled guilty to making a false police report. He reportedly faked a kidnapping to avoid appearing in court. In 1994, he emerged once again on law enforcement's radar. He was put on an offender's register under the alias Greg Tunningly for abusing a 13-year-old girl in California. New court records identified the man as Stafford. Pat revealed she always suspected Stafford was behind her daughter's disappearance after she discovered the pair had carried on a secret relationship. Pat said, I have known, I have known from the start. When my daughter came up missing, I have known that he was the person responsible. The investigators did not listen to me, Pat added, that that thought had lived with her for the past 37 years. She continued, It was like I was lost. Honestly, it was like I was the walking deceased woman. It hurt when I heard people talking about their grandkids and their kids. Pat said the memories of her 15-year-old daughter were what kept her going. She remembered, Susan was outgoing. She was funny. She was just an average teenager, just trying to figure out where she fits. Pat never lost hope, but the quest to find her daughter was agonizing until now. She said she has had to lean on her faith. She stated, I'm grateful. I'm glad that the system has finally decided to step up and do something instead of have me wondering. Those closest to Susan hope to learn where she is in hopes of giving her the farewell they always felt she deserved. Now in the final act, her mother says the one thing she has never wrestled with is forgiveness towards Stafford. I know this is going to sound kind of strange, but I have forgiven him for what he did to my daughter. I really have, because I would not want to carry that with me for the rest of my life. Pat said this arrest has lifted a dark cloud from her shoulders. Now I am not looking forward to how the trial will play out. I just want Susan's body found. She concluded, My message is a simple one. Start listening to your kids. Forty-five-year-old Susan Tice lived in Toronto, Canada in 1983. She was a mother of four children and worked as a social worker. Her body was found in the upstairs bedroom of her recently purchased home on Grace Street on August 17, 1983. She had moved to Toronto from Calgary in July and separated from her husband, who was living in a downtown townhouse. By the time her body was found by a relative, the mail had piled up outside of her home. She had suffered multiple stab wounds to the chest. An autopsy was unable to determine when exactly her life ended. Police admitted that they had few leads on the case. A detective said at the time, we have no suspect at all. Four months later, on December 20th of 1983, 22-year-old Erin Gilmore's body was found in her Toronto apartment. A friend, who went to pick her up for a cocktail party, found Erin's body. Like Susan Tice, Erin had been stabbed, assaulted, and found in her bedroom. Police canvassed door-to-door -to, -door to no avail. Erin was an aspiring clothing designer from a wealthy family. Her father, David Gilmore, had been the business partner of tycoon Peter Monk, co-founder of the mining company Barrick Gold. It was Monk's son who found Aaron's body. For years, then decades, investigators knew little about what happened to Susan and Aaron, except that they suffered a similar fate. In 2008, advances in DNA technology brought a break, 
confirming through evidence at the scenes that one man was responsible for what happened to both Susan and Aaron. But it would take nearly 15 more years and even greater scientific advances to identify who he was. Recently, via a combination of advanced genetic sequencing, forensic genealogy, and traditional police work that's now regularly cracking open decades-old cases, investigators arrested 60-year-old Joseph George Sutherland from Moosonee, Ontario, Canada, in connection with Susan and Aaron's cases. Moosonee is a remote community far removed from the slayings that police allege he committed nearly 40 years ago. Detective Sergeant Stephen Smith, the lead Toronto police investigator, speculated that Sutherland had been waiting for the knock to come at the door. Smith told reporters that a second phase of the investigation must now begin. A painstaking review of Sutherland's whereabouts in the intervening 39 years. Obviously, we're going to look into every possible connection to any possible case throughout Ontario to ensure that he isn't responsible for any other offenses, Smith said. The cases are just the latest advances through genetic genealogy, a cutting-edge process that has breathed new life into old cases all but declared unsolvable. Detective Smith said that the scientific advances were the only way the cases were ever going to be solved. Joseph Sutherland was 22 years old at the time that he took the lives of Susan and Aaron. He was never a suspect in the case, nor had he ever been interviewed. He had been living in Toronto at the time, but later moved to Moosonee. A Facebook profile for Sutherland reveals a person going about a seemingly normal life, enjoying the outdoors and requesting recommendations for services like an electrician, while griping with everyday problems. Retired Toronto detective Mark Mendelson said that investigators can also turn to classic techniques to identify any other crimes they believe Sutherland may be responsible for, including photo lineups. If previous cases had eyewitnesses as well as fingerprint analysis, now that Sutherland's fingerprints will be in a centralized system known as APHIS, he said it's also entirely possible that Sutherland never went on to commit other violent acts but he said there isn't enough statistical data about serial criminals to have an informed discussion about it. The former cop said one thing is certain. It's a clear example of, ain't science wonderful? Sutherland is scheduled to appear in court soon in 2023. One of Aaron Gilmore's brothers, Sean McCowan, had this to say about the arrest. The best call I've ever received. This is a day that I, and we, have been waiting almost an entire lifetime for, McCowan said. For nearly four decades, the culprit had been a ghost, said McCowan, adding that his mother, who passed away two years ago, never recovered from the loss of her only daughter. She would have been so relieved that there had been an arrest, and so happy that someone will face justice after being anonymous for 39 years, McCowan said. Skeletal remains were found in June of 1974 in an area known as the Burnt Bridges along the A1A Bridge in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The remains belonged to a young white woman. Detectives at the time believed she was between the ages of 15 and 20. It could not be determined how she lost her life, but it was noted that she was found tied up in the mangroves to a tree. Recently, DNA that was obtained from the remains were entered into the National Database for Unidentified Persons but they could not find a match. It wasn't until November 2021 that genealogy tests were performed on the remains by scientists working at Othram Lab. This resulted in the victim's identification. In June of 2022, she was identified as Susan Gale Poole. Susan was born on February 12, 1957 and lived in a trailer park in North Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Susan was 15 years old when she disappeared just before Christmas in 1972. Her family did report her missing back then. Susan's sister Patty had this to say about the identification. I had always hoped she would come back. The search is finally over. Investigators believe Susan was a victim of Gerard Schaefer. Schaefer committed many similar crimes. 
He lived in the same area as Susan back in 1974. He got arrested for kidnapping two girls, taking them out on the A1A bridge and tying them up in mangroves. Schaefer was known to pick up girls who were hitchhiking. Friends of Susan told investigators that Susan often hitchhiked. He was convicted for his crimes and his life was taken in prison in 1996. While detectives believe he is responsible for what happened to Susan, they do not have any physical evidence linking him to the crime. Susan's mother is still alive and is now in her 90s. She has also been informed about the identification. Tipsters may remain anonymous by calling Crime Stoppers at 800-458-TIPS. Twenty-two-year-old Susan Amy Morse lived in Mesa, Arizona in 1989. She lived alone in an apartment near Country Club Drive and Southern Avenue in Mesa. On October 16, 1989, Susan's body was found in her apartment. She had been assaulted and strangled. Investigators collected DNA belonging to the suspect from her body. They also interviewed residents of the apartment building. Some residents said they saw Susan the previous day. This helped investigators to create a timeline. A year later, in November 1990, another crime took place in that apartment building. A 23-year-old woman was assaulted. The man stole her money and a VCR, but fortunately, she survived the attack. Investigators collected DNA from her too, and was able to confirm that it was the same man that was responsible for both crimes. Unfortunately, as DNA was not advanced enough, investigators could not identify the man and the case went cold. Recently, however, with the help of genetic genealogy, investigators could use the DNA collected back in 1989 and 1990 to identify the man. He is 58-year-old Thomas Cox. Cox was arrested in Colorado Springs on April 26, 2022 by the FBI and officers from the Mesa Police Department. He has already been taken to jail in Arizona. The Mesa Police Department is hoping this will bring some answers and closure for the two separate cases and their families. Mesa Police Department Sergeant Chuck Trapini had this to say, Ms. Moores, she doesn't have any family that we know of. Her parents have passed away, but we do have the second victim, which is the victim of the assault. She is still alive, and from what the detective told me, she is so happy that we caught the suspect. Of course, after his arrest, we were able to analyze his fingerprints, the fingerprints at the scene, and we got a hit there as well. So it was a great collaboration between the FBI and the county's attorney's office and the Mesa PD. We can't give enough credit to the detectives that worked this case. We just constantly look for stuff. When there's new technology or new techniques on how to identify a suspect or examine evidence, we buy into that and we re-examined the evidence as the years go on, and in this particular case, it worked out dramatically. Cox is being held on a $1 million cash bond only. His next court hearing will be on April 29, 2022. Investigators do not believe that Cox knew either of the two victims, but did note that his mother lived right next door to Susan. Forty-eight-year-old Susan Winters lived in Henderson, Nevada in 2015 with her husband Gregory Brent Dennis and two teenage daughters. Susan was a judge and Gregory was a doctor. On January 3, 2015, Gregory called 911 to report Susan was unresponsive and needed an ambulance. She was taken to the hospital but did not make it. A mixture of antifreeze was found in her system. At first, it was believed that she might have taken her own life by ingesting the antifreeze. Investigators then found Gregory had an expensive drug habit. He also stood to inherit $2 million in the event of his wife's demise. According to friends, Gregory and Susan was on the verge of separation when her life ended. Investigators also found that Gregory only called emergency responders after she stopped breathing. Inexplicably, Gregory also signed a do not resuscitate order when she arrived at the hospital. Days after Susan's passing, Gregory deposited a $180,000 check from her bank account into his own bank account. The check had been issued the night before Susan lost her life. According to a friend of Gregory, he wanted the money because he knew Susan's parents would freeze the account. This meant that Gregory knew Susan would not be alive anymore before it happened. The final piece of evidence came when investigators took a look at Gregory's computer. He searched for information on the internet on how long after poisoning someone using antifreeze it would take the victim to pass away. In 2017, he was finally arrested in connection to the case. 
Shortly after being arrested, he posted a $250,000 bail and was released. In 2022, Gregory and his legal team pleaded guilty and agreed to a sentence of 3 to 10 years behind bars. He is scheduled to be sentenced on May 10th in the Clark County District Court.